Hi students, in this lecture, I'm going to discuss Kepler's laws. Let us see one statements coming to first one. It says that all planets revolve in elliptical orbits with the sun at one focus. Second one, it is known as law of areas. The radius vector joining the sun and the planet sweeps equal areas in equal time intervals. And third one is known as law of time periods. And it is square of the time period of revolution is proportional to cube of the semi-major axis. Let us see in detail. So coming to the first statement, it says about shape of orbits. It is elliptical. It is elliptical. In that you can see from here to up to this point that is known as major axis. So taking its length as 2a. And take now from here to up to this end. That is it taken as minor axis. And that length is 2b. Okay. Now coming to the first statement. All planets revolve in elliptical orbits with the sun at one focus. So having one focus somewhere here. You can say S1 and second one here. So sun may be at S1 or may be at S2. So they revolve in elliptical orbits with the sun at one of this focus. Okay. Now coming to the second one. Coming to the second one, which is known as law of areas. Suppose sun is now somewhere here. So S yes, stands for sun. Let us take this is now location of planet at one instant. If you are taking now some time interval, the planet moves from here to up to here. Or you can say P1 to P2. Okay. Now, this is an area covered by that radius vector in some time interval. Now, it says that that radius vector covers equal areas in equal time intervals. That means dA by dt is a constant. We are calling it as aerial velocity. dA by dt is known as Aerial velocity. Let us see why it is a constant. Let us take small time interval dt. Take a small time interval dt. In that small time interval, planet moves from P1 to P2. Okay. Since we are taking very small time interval, the length S1 P, the length S P1 is approximately equal to S P. So both lengths are equal. Let us take this radius vector turns by an angle D theta. Okay. Then area of that S P1 P2, area of S P1 P2 will be it will be half, let us take that length as r, half r square d theta. It is nothing but area of a sector, right? This is now area covered by radius vector in a small time interval dt. That is dA. If you are taking now dA by dt, dA by dt, 
that is equal to a half r square d theta by dt. So this d theta by dt is known as angular velocity. Now let us multiply this with the mass of planet and divide the same mass m. So multiplying and dividing with mass of planet. Now in the place of m r square, we can write moment of inertia. d theta by dt is the omega. So i into omega is known as angular momentum, that is L. Rebounding is 2m. Okay. Because when you are taking about the sun, when compared with the separation between sun and the planet, size of a sun, and size of planet, they are very small. So we can take them as point masses. So about the sun, moment of inertia of the planet is m r square. So here I am writing in the place of m r square, it is i, i into omega. So here d theta by dt, that is angular velocity. So i into omega is now l angular moment okay now you can see here if you assume that we are having only sun and this planet there are no other planets in this universe assume only sun and planet then the only force acting on this planet is gravitational force by sun which is passing through sun so if you take a torque equation about the sun then net torque will be zero. So since net torque zero about the sun, we can write conservation of angular momentum. That means for the planet, angular momentum is a constant. So L is a constant. Mass, mass of planet, it is also constant. That means this total value is a constant. That means dA by dt is a constant. That is what we are calling as Kepler's second law, right? Means it covers equal areas in equal time intervals. That indicates that if distance of planet is more from the sun, speed will be less. If distance of planet is less, that speed will be more. That is what we can conclude from this second law. Okay? Right. Now you can see here. When separation is minimum, when separation is minimum or maximum, velocity vector will be normal to radius vector. This is velocity vector, take it as V1. When separation minimum and it V2, when separation is maximum. So when separation is a maximum or minimum, velocity vector will be normal to radius vector. So if you take angular momentum for a particle, L bar equal to R bar cross P bar, which is equal to M into V into R into sin theta. Okay. Here mass is a constant. So remaining is now V R sin theta is a constant. Now if you apply this one at minimum separation and maximum separation, then angle becomes 90. Then we can write, suppose separation is here R1 and this is R2. We can write first condition V1 R1 is equal to V2 R. Okay. Now, since gravity is a conservative force, we can write conservation of mechanical energy. That means potential energy equal to minus g m1 m2. m is mass of sun and small m is mass of planet by separation is r1 plus kinetic energy half m v1 square that is equal to when separation is maximum, potential energy minus g m1 m2 by r2 plus 
कायनेट एकनाची हाफ यम वी टू स्क्वायर ओके नाउ यू कैन सी हियर नंबर ऑफ अननोन्स v1 and v2 we have two unknowns and we got here two equations because in ellipse you are knowing that separation from focus to up to here distance equal to r1 equal to a into 1 minus c r2 equal to a into 1 plus c right so we are having here two unknowns v1 v2 and we have two equations now solving these two we are going to get v1 and v2 okay see values once So after making calculation, we are going to get so V1 equal to root of G M by A into V1 means speed is maximum. So it is 1 plus E by 1 minus C and coming to V2, root of G M by A, 1 minus C e by 1 plus C. So V1, maximum speed, and V2, speed is minimum. And if you substitute here, R1 and V1, we are going to get total energy, which comes out to be, which comes out to be, which comes out to be minus G M1 M2 by 2A. This is what we have discussed earlier, right? In earlier lecture, there we have discussed like taking sucker orbit. In the place of R, we have taken semi-major axis, right? So here total energy is a constant. So we can use now this result directly while solving problems, right? Next, let us see. Let us see third law. So we can explain third law by taking shape of the arbitrary circle. Let us see once by using Newton's universal law of gravitation. If arbitrary shape is circle, So we are taking now one special case if orbit is circle. We want to discuss now that Kepler's third law. Let us see. The only force acting on the planet is force by sun, gravitational force, which provides centripetal force. G M1 M2 by R square. That centripetal force equal to mass into acceleration is r omega square. So from this we can write we are getting the value of omega square, right? That is g m by r cube. From that we are going to get t value. t equal to 2 pi by omega and that is 2 pi root of r cube by g m. Okay. So from this, we can say directly T square proportional to R cube. This is in case of circular orbits. If it is elliptical, then it is a proportional to cube of semi-major axis. So like this, we can explain third law by using Newton's universal law of gravitation. Right? Okay. Now see next geostationary satellite what it means a satellite that rewards around the earth and it appears to be at rest with respect to the earth is called 
geostationary satellite or parking satellite. So its a height is approximately 36,000 km. Its orbit must lie in the equatorial plane of the Earth and rotates from west to east. And time period of revolution is 24 hours. Let us see once all these points. Suppose this is now Earth. There is a one person now here. You can say person P here on the Earth. See, this is what we call equator. Now, satellite must revolve in the equatorial plane. That means it should be like this, okay, in this way. E equatorial plane. Now, for the person, this satellite appears to be always at rest. Its meaning is that when Earth completes one rotation, when Earth completes one rotation, this will complete one revolution around the Earth. This completes one revolution around the Earth. In that case, for this person, this satellite appears to be always at rest. Okay. That is what we call stationary satellites. And you can see its uses. It is mainly used for communication purpose. And there are points regarding the geostationary satellite. Then see next. Gravitational mass versus inertial mass. See once what is the meaning of gravitational mass. See if you are finding weight of an object let us call it as W, weight of an object. If you divide that with acceleration due to gravity, or we can say, so we are dividing weight of an object with acceleration due to gravity. Then that is giving us mass of that object. So this is known as gravitational mass. So here what happens is, we can take this object anywhere in the universe, finding weight there, and find a G value at that place. So if you take ratio, that will be always the same. Okay, that means gravitational mass is a constant. Okay, but if you are taking inertial mass, we are knowing that net force is equal to mass into acceleration. That means if you are dividing, let us call it as m suffix g, gravitational mass. This is m suffix i, inertial mass. Inertial mass equal to net force by acceleration. For example, take a surface which is smooth apply force F. Now this force becomes net force. That net force by acceleration gives mass of that object. And that mass we are calling as inertial mass. And see here, because of the force, it is moving. So when it is moving, because of velocity, its mass changes. And this change will be very small whenever its speed is very small compared to speed of light. But if its speed is comparable to speed of light, that change in mass is not small. That means here we conclude that inertial mass, it is not a constant. If a speed is more, mass will be more. So that we can write it as m equal to m naught by square root of 1 minus v square by c square where m naught is when its velocity is 0 
if its velocity is very small compared to speed of light, this will be almost zero. But if velocity is not small when compared to speed of light, then this factor also not negligible. That's why inertial mass depends on speed, whereas gravitational mass is always constant. Okay. Let us see the points regarding these two. Ratio of weight of the body to acceleration due to gravity. That is what we call gravitational mass. Ratio of net force to acceleration is called inertial mass. Gravitational mass of a body is constant. It is independent of a speed. That is what we have discussed, right? Inertial mass depends on speed. If a speed is compatible to speed of light, then its mass changes. Okay. Let us see next one. Principle of equivalence. So first C statement, a uniform gravitational field can be treated as a uniform accelerating field. Hence, inertial mass and gravitational mass are identical. Let us see the meaning of the statement. For example, Imagine a person is now inside a lift. A person is inside a lift. Or you can take the person standing on a weighing machine. This is a weighing machine. Person standing on that. Assume lift having no acceleration. Now he is seeing what is ready. Okay. Now let us assume that there is no gravity. Assume that there is no gravity. Then he feels no weight. Right. Now let us consider lift is accelerating upwards and acceleration equal to g. I am repeating. In first case, we have taken lift having no acceleration. So his weight equal to mg. Now I am taking second case. Assume in the lift there is no gravity. So person feels now, he feels like weightlessness. Right? Now assume that lift has acceleration upwards, which is equal to g. Now what happens is on the person should have four sides, which is mg downwards. Right. In case one, no acceleration because of gravity. Person he was having some weight, reading equal to mg. Now second case, no gravity but lift is having acceleration which is equal to g. Again, the weighing machine shows the same reading. That means first case where no acceleration, only gravity. Second case, no gravity but only acceleration. Now, both are identical. This is what we call principle of equivalence. Okay. So, in both cases, we are going to get same reading. That means same mass. The meaning of inertial mass and identical, sorry, gravitational mass are identical. So, it is now a uniform gravitational field can be treated as uniform accelerating field. That means we have taken lift is having acceleration of course, right? That is the meaning of this statement, right? Let us now solve problems basing on Kepler's laws. Let's see first one. If the distance between the earth and the sun were half its present value, the number of days in a year would have been asked in 1996 for two marks. So he's asking regarding number of days in a year, right? When it becomes half of the present distance. 
that means we have to focus now Kepler's third law, which is known as law of orbits. So by using that, t square proportional to r cube, where r is now distance, then I can write t2 by t1 whole square is equal to r2 by r1 whole cube r from this t2 is equal to t1 into r2 by r1 whole power 3 by 2 now substitute values in this t1 initially 365 days r2 now distance is becoming half right so r2 by r1 becomes half power 3 by 2 this is a final answer which comes approximately 129 days okay so it is second and second option right see next one imagine a light planet revolving around a very massive star <coughs> in a circular orbit of radius Kepler with a period of revolution t. If the gravitational force of attraction between the planet and the star is proportional to r power minus 5 by 2, then this is the question asked in 1989 for two marks. We have to get T square proportional to condition is given force of attraction is proportional to r power minus 5 by 2. Again, basing on Kepler's third law, C once T square proportional to r cube, or what we can do is centripetal force G M M by. Now, instead of taking r square, now we have to consider r power 5 by 2. Okay. It is given that force proportional to r power minus 5 by 2. In the place of r square, taking r power 5 by 2. That is providing centripetal force, which is equal to mass into centripetal acceleration. So, m r omega square. From this, what we can say is, Omega square proportional to 1 by r power, r power 5 by 2 plus 1, 7 by 2. Omega square, omega means 2 pi by t, that implies 1 by t square proportional to 1 by r power 7 by 2. That means we can say that r square proportional to, sorry, t square proportional to r power 7 by 2. So directly we can say by using that centripetal force equal to mass into acceleration without using Kepler's third law. Right? Right. See in next one. A double star system consists of two stars A and B which have time periods Ta and Tb, radii Ra and Rb, masses Me and Mb. Choose correct option. So, as in 2006 for 3 marks. And if you remember in gravitation lecture 4 and question number 4, we have discussed same problem. And there we can answer this now Ta equal to Tb, right? So you can refer once for this one, gravitation lecture four. Okay, in that question number four, you can see same question, right? Right, see next one. 